All right. So uh, this event will start with about a 90 minute panel discussion, followed by a 30 minute Q&A, um, where anyone in the audience will be able to ask questions to our panelists or to our moderator. Um, so you can ask questions at any time throughout the event by using the Zoom Q&A feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen in your Zoom menu bar. Um, we have disabled the chat for chatting between attendees um, just to be accessible for people who use screen readers. So you can send a chat to us panelists, but if you wanna chat with your fellow attendees, please do use the Q&A feature. Um, and if the Q&A feature is inaccessible to you, you have other options. Um, so during the Q&A portion at the end of the event, um, you can click the raise hand button also on your bottom Zoom menu to let us know that you'd like to be unmuted so you can ask your question out loud. Um, you can also give us a call um, or an email and I have dropped that information in the chat. I'll drop it in the chat again. Um, you can give us a call at 203-979-2557 or send an email to, to me, to ksweeney at art-newyork.org. Um, and you can ask your question via phone or email if those options are more accessible to you. All right, um, so before I pass it over to our moderator, Greg, um, I want to offer up a land acknowledgement. Um, and a land acknowledgement is um, a practice that um, acknowledges, as the name suggests, uh, the land that we are on and the fact that we are on stolen land. Um, and even though we're not all you know, together on the same land right now, we're you know, spread all across the country. I still think it's important for us to take a moment to um, just be cognizant of the history of where we are. Um, so I will be acknowledging the land from the five boroughs of New York City because that is where Art New York's membership is based and it is where Queens Theater's physical location is in Queens, New York. Um, but if you are currently located outside of New York, I will also drop a link in the chat um, to learn about um, where you can go to learn about the history of the land that you are on. So um, I would like to take this time to acknowledge that wherever we're currently located on Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America, we are on occupied territory. So Art New York's membership in the five boroughs of New York City operates on the unceded ancestral land of the Lenape, Wappinger, Canarsie, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities. And I will give the interpreter a moment to catch up with that. Great. Um, uh, uh, I wanna honor and celebrate all of these indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. I also want to take this time to acknowledge that after there was stolen land, there were stolen people. And I want to honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country that we occupy today. And since we are gathered today in virtual space, let's also take a moment to consider the legacies of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous people worldwide. So I invite you to join me in acknowledging all of this as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, anti-racism and allyship. Thank you. Um, and I just want to credit the virtual part of that land acknowledgement was written by Adrian Wong of Spider Web Show in Ontario, Canada. Um, all right, so now I would like to introduce our moderator, Greg Mazgala. Um, Greg is um, an actor, a writer, 
um, an advocate, and he also is the Director of Inclusion at Queen's Theatre, who is partnering with Art New York for this event. Um, so Greg, I will now invite you to turn on your camera and introduce yourself. Uh, thank you so much, Kirsten. Uh, hold on, sorry. Um, hello, thank you so much, for, Kirsten, for that introduction and to Art New York and Queen's Theatre for facilitating uh, this conversation. So very exciting. Um, as Kirsten mentioned, I am the Director of Inclusion at Queen's Theatre. I'm a white cisgender male with uh, brown hair, hazel eyes. I have a salt and pepper beard. I'm wearing a black Henley uh, long sleeve shirt and gray pants. And my pronouns are he, him. I'm very excited to have this conversation and these uh, uh, to be joined by my fellow panelists, these great theater professionals and artists that have uh, agreed to join us today. Uh, I just want to go ahead and uh, jump right in with introductions and get started. We have a lot to talk about. Uh, we can only cover so much in uh, 90 minutes. We're going to talk for about 90 minutes and then open it up to, to Q&A afterwards uh, for about 30 minutes. Um, so uh, let's just get started, y'all. Um, I'd first like to uh, invite to the screen um, Brian Balcom. If you could join us on camera, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Brian Malcolm. I am uh, a director and access coordinator at Victory Gardens Theater. I am an Asian cisgender male, uh, he, him. Uh, I am wearing a black t-shirt uh, and have short black hair. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, A.A. Brenner, please join us on camera and introduce yourself. Hey there, thanks so much for having me, uh, Greg and everyone. Uh, I'm AA, I'm a playwright and dramaturg based in New York City. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, theirs. Uh, today I am wearing a wool blazer, a black t-shirt, and I am a white non-binary person uh, with these lovely uh, thick rimmed glasses. Thanks. Thank you, AA. Evan Cummings. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan T. Cummings. I am a uh, freelance director, also a playwright, uh, based in New York City. Uh, he, him, his pronouns. Um, I'm a white 30-something male um, with a dark beard, uh, currently um, wearing a um, blue zip-up with a blue t-shirt, and um, in the background have um, uh, some books and a record player uh, in my bedroom that's on the west side of Manhattan. And I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Evan. We're excited to have you. And uh, Jonathan Norton. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Norton. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I uh, am an African American male. I have a uh, a gray or charcoal uh, uh, jacket on. It's a Stout Theater Center, a red t-shirt, um, crazy curly hair uh, that crowns a thin face. Uh, I am in my living room with some pictures, I guess. I don't, I don't know if I say left or right, depending upon what you see on your screen or, or what have you, or what's in my room, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, and I am coming to you from the unceded land of the Kikapu people, which is also known as uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, and I'm the playwright in residence at the Dallas Theater Center. Thank you so much. I would just add, um, just to, to avoid any sound issues or for any anyone who has any access issues, uh, for our panelists, if you could please mute yourself if not speaking, um, that would just be great. Um, thank you. Um, and we will keep it on if we can't hear you. Um, uh, to ask you to unmute yourself, but thank you for that. What a fantastic group of people. This is so exciting. Uh, thank you for joining us from all across the country. Um, I just wanted, before I launch into the questions, I just wanted to, if you'll humor me for a moment, why is it important to talk about artistry? Why is it important to talk about aesthetic, particularly in relation to this community or these communities? Um, and if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'm actually helping plan another uh, discussion at a conference in a few months. Um, and uh, the person who brokered that conversation said, I wanna arrange a conversation about access. 
And they told me that their response was, why should we talk about that? That's just ramps. And, you know, after I sort of cooled down and uh, while I have good reason to be upset about that response in 2020, um, you know, the second decade of the 21st century and just reminding people that we're still in the 30th anniversary of the ADA. <clears throat> I don't, accessibility is important. Access is important. Um, but I think what that person said is a really honest reaction because we are artists, we are theater professionals. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to talk about artistry um, and theater and the things that get us excited about being in this profession and in the cultural sector. Uh, structure mortar access is important, but that maybe that's not our focus. That's not my focus. Maybe that should be left to the architects and the advocates, which do incredible important work. What I really love to talk about is theater is the artistry, is the art making. I love getting in a room and making stuff with people. That is the great joy of this profession. And the collaborative act of that, I think is very powerful. And in my experience to date, uh, artistry has always driven access. The play, the theatrical event itself has always driven access in myriad ways. So I think that's why it's important that we have this focus and begin to talk about access and artistry in particular, um, excuse me, artistry and aesthetics, right? As it relates to this community so we can get to the work because that is the currency in which we deal with on a regular basis in this work that we do. And ultimately it's what people enjoy talking about. And I think what people can comprehend and metabolize and understand. So <clears throat> now I'm not very smart. Right. And we say, uh, we know we, we have this term aesthetics. Right. And I, you know, in preparing for this conversation, I had to ask myself what that really means. I mean, it's this phrase and this term that we hear a lot. And again, not to be reductive, but if you'll just humor me again, I had to look up what that actually means. Right. And the word aesthetic as an adjective, adjective is concerned with beauty or the appreciation of beauty. And as a noun, aesthetic is a set of principles underlying and guiding the work of a particular artist or artistic movement. And just to geek out a little further, the uh, roots or origins of that word are rooted in the Greek, uh, apologies to any fluent Greek speakers, uh, in the Greek word aesthetikos, which means to perceive or relating to perception by the senses. So again, we, we use, hear these terms all the time, right? But I, I just wanna go back to, I guess the noun definition. I love that it's linked to beauty, right? Uh, and that its roots are in how beautiful things are and wanting to share the beauty of things, right? And how we perceive that beauty, particularly in relation to these communities, right? The deaf and disabled communities. But I think that the, the definition of the noun is really sort of what hits me as we, as we work and struggle to define what disability aesthetics are. I know for me personally, I only really heard that term a few years ago and I'm still trying to figure out what that is. Kirsten in her introduction said, this is a nebulous term. So I also, I just wanna give ourselves in this discussion and this permission for the panelists and for anybody uh, attending to be able to speak in you know, rough drafts or give themselves the freedom to articulate something that they may not uh, have the fluency or vocabulary, vocabulary yet to articulate. But I just wanna read that definition again, uh, that noun definition of aesthetic, a set of principles underlying and guiding the work of a particular artist or artistic movement. We are a particular artist. We are part of artistic movements. Uh, maybe several, right, rooted to our identities or various identities. Um, and I wanted to start by asking everyone on this panel uh, the same general question, which is, how would you describe your personal aesthetic? And how does your disability inform that aesthetic? And I'll just go in alphabetical order, if you don't mind. Brian, do you want to kick us off with that? Sure, absolutely. 
uh, yeah, I, I have found myself more and more attracted to underdog stories about people uh, fighting against either all odds or insurmountable odds um, to for what they believe is right or to be seen. Um, and I think some of those stories are really interesting when the protagonist doesn't always win. What happens then? Uh, I'm also interested in, uh, um, well, uh, to take a half step back, um, uh, when the protagonist doesn't always win is, I think, a really interesting point where you get into conversations with yourselves about what is right. When you look at, when you watch a show and you see, you agree with both sides of the issue, where you see yourself in the antagonist and you see yourself in the protagonist and you, you, you understand why they're saying the things they say, why they're doing the things they do. That's what creates, I think, that's what creates, is the beginning of the creation of empathy, uh, which I think is really important um, for obvious reasons. Uh, I also really enjoy classic stories that are being retold through uh, the lens of underrepresented groups. Um, and you know, underneath all that, I also really love to be entertained. So uh, there's that as well. And you know, I for a long time, I I sort of I didn't deny my disability. I, I, I wasn't rejecting it or refusing it. But I, you know, in when you go through rehabilitation for a spinal cord injury, which I do have, uh, you know, you're being taught to be independent. You're being taught to navigate the world as non-disabled as possible. And for a while, I, I, I think I just didn't acknowledge it uh, completely and didn't wholly accept it, even though I wasn't necessarily rejecting it. And, you know, when Greg asked this question in, you know, a, a pre-planning meeting, I, you know, it, it realized that, well, yes, all of those things I said are driven by uh, how I navigated through the world uh, with my disability. And, and I was injured uh, when I was 13 years old uh, back in the early 90s. So I've had a long time to um, navigate this world with my disability. So that is um, uh, that is how I see the world now. And that is uh, how I see the art I want to make. Thank you, Brian. Um, hey, Brenner. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting, uh, this question of like, what is disability artistry? You know, as you said, Greg, basically all I feel like I can speak to is what is my own artistry and what is my aesthetic. Um, and as a disabled person, everything I make is going to be informed by the fact that I am a disabled non-binary person moving through the world. Um, so for me, my goal as a writer generally is to unravel the concept of normalcy um, whatever that means, which, you know, I leave that opaque because it doesn't really mean anything, right? Um, like, I want to show audiences that no one is really normal and that that, in effect, makes us all normal, right? So uh, to do that, I love to play with uh, defamiliarization and I really enjoy uh, shifting perspectives and perception of audiences to, you know, shine a different sort of light on the show that they might be seeing and, and to show them that things are usually not really as they seem or as they expect to think that they are. Um, and that's actually a good thing, you know, um, duality is great, complexity is great. We are all complex people with so many different intersecting identities and life experiences. And, you know, it's, it's part of being human is to make assumptions about folks, but uh, a beautiful thing about art is that we can shine a light on those and say, hey, like, what are you doing? Let's take a step back. Let's try to, to view things more ho holistically if we can, or at the very least understand that there is nuance. Um, and yeah, just personally, as a queer non-binary person who has cerebral palsy, uh, my whole life has kind of been a process of deconstructing what is normal and what it means to be normal. Um, kind of like what Brian said, growing up, um, you know, I had CP always, I had it from birth. Um, I, you know, went through a lot of physical therapy and a lot of that was in order to allow me to pass and do things that, you know, other kids could do. Um, and what I've learned over, I mean, I'm 26 years old, uh, is that I am my best self as an artist and a person when I accept myself and am my most authentic self. Uh, and I hope that my art empowers other people to do that too. Uh, and, you know, while passing 
in so many ways, sometimes, you know, we need to for safety reasons, right? In a lot of communities, um, as a non-binary person and a queer person, especially, that's how I relate to that. Um, I, I, I hope that our art can, can make the world a better place where we can all, you know, accept ourselves and encourage others to accept themselves as two and to accept each other. Amazing. Yeah, again, you brought up perception, right? And I think, again, the definition of aesthetics is rooted in perception. And like, I think theater does a great job, like art does a great job of presenting challenging, of challenging perceptions, which is really a great, you know, idea. And I think, anyway, this is just the beginning of a conversation, but uh, hopefully we can continue this conversation um, in platforms like this and through each other's work, right? Through the sharing of each other's work. But thank you, Aeth, it's beautiful. Um, I wasn't choked up, I just needed to take a sip of water. I'm sorry. <laughs> mm. um, Evan. Uh, how would you define your personal aesthetic and uh, how if at all does disability inform that aesthetic? Well, I guess I'm really grateful for that kind of dual definition that you that you offered, Greg, the idea of aesthetic um, being both the principles underlying underlying and guiding the work and the the beauty perceived by the senses. And I feel like um, in in theatrical artistry, the the perception of that isn't always the uh, oral or the visual. Um, I, I, I honestly, I feel like um, in in striving towards an aesthetic of my own, it's wanting to um, you know have my work perceived by the, the the beating heart of of an audience and the and the gut reaction. Um, and uh, I feel like. Um, uh, if I were to um, try to kind of uh, really specify the elements that um, I'm, I'm often most interested in exploring uh, as far as my aesthetic and underlying principles, um, it's kind of um, uh, pushing, pushing the audience outside the realm of, of safety, um, acknowledging that danger and loss and uncertainty and struggle are, are real things um, and uh, kind of uh, often wanting to um, put it, put someone who's experiencing my work in a place of saying, all right, how would I, how would I navigate this? How would I um, uh, uh, kind of take the twists and turns that uh, this character is experiencing and um, reflect it in my own life or my own experiences, kind of exploring that, that darkness, the, the, the tipping points in life. Um, and uh, and uh, kind of the the duality of that, um, recognizing that um, compassion and empathy and connection um, for me um, in the stories that I'm telling are are the roots towards um, being able to navigate that and being able to um, kind of recognize the darkness and push past it, recognize the challenge that. <laughs> that can come along in life and the fact that it, uh, you know, um, uh, challenge and struggle doesn't know uh, age and it doesn't know geography and it doesn't know particular background. It's, um, it's, it's universal. Um, and uh, uh, I, I feel certainly the, the way that my experience of disability um, uh, uh, kind of informs that work and informs that perspective. Um, certainly, uh, uh, for the fact that um, uh, similar to Brian, uh, I, I um, uh, had an injury um, and uh, uh, spinal cord injury at, at a young age, uh, uh, around 13 years old, and um, uh, and therefore um, kind of had an experience early in life that um, things can change and curveballs can come along and um, uh, and uh, we kind of figure out and recognize how to navigate that. Um, uh, but I also, um, I kind of feel like uh, everything that I've just said is, is a kind of perspective and aesthetic. Uh, and yet um, the way that disability sometimes um, kind of connects with that is uh, I'm not always or even often um, uh, given or finding the opportunity to explore that particular kind of story. Sometimes there are assumptions uh, related to disability or not, but um, 
uh, often it can feel like assumptions related to disability, that the work that I want to do is only in the disability realm. Uh, and that uh, some, sometimes is true, but it's kind of the Venn diagram of the overlap between um, uh, that, the kind of aesthetic that I describe and, uh, and stories of disability and experiences of disability. And I'm sure we'll, we'll get to talking a bit more about that. What, sto what stories are our responsibility to tell? What stories do we get the opportunity to tell? And um, where, where, um, where is that offered? Where is that space? Thank you, Evan. Yeah, I, I love that last thought. And again, it just reminds me to one thing that I forgot to mention in this, in the intro before bringing you all on, why this panel consists of uh, mostly playwrights and directors, because again, in the hierarchy of, you know, uh, theater, right? Uh, again, I feel like directors and playwrights, more so than most, define, right, the aesthetic. Right or the artistry that that actors and designers and what they fulfill or participate in. Right. Um, so just if anyone was wondering about why the panel is consists of the folks that it does, that was the logic and rationale behind that. Um, but thank you, Evan. Yeah, I'm sure we'll get to that um, last part. But Jonathan, please uh, love to hear your perspective. Thank you. You know, uh, after eight or nine months of this, you would think that I would. Um, remind myself easily to unmute myself, but that's apparently still a challenge. Uh, so anyway, um, my aesthetic is very much influenced uh, by my environment. Uh, again, I, I, I live in Dallas, Texas, um, Texas, everything's bigger in Texas. Um, and so I've just always had this, um, uh, this desire and this appetite for um, finding ways to tell stories uh, on a really large scale, even in a situation where there might be a certain, there's a, uh, in terms of size and scope, it might actually feel intimate, but, but there's something that kind of blows it up in a certain kind of way that gives it a certain expansiveness. Um, I'm also always interested in stories uh, where I can, um, uh, I always joke with myself about finding ways to challenge designers and finding ways to challenge producers. It's something I enjoy quite a bit. Uh, so from, um, from that particular standpoint, um, I would say that there is uh, uh, a love of playing with size and scale and scope and what have you. Uh, from the other standpoint, again, uh, related to Texas, uh, is the fact that um, I believe that 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 here in Texas, um, uh, it's a lot uh, more difficult to uh, segregate yourself or isolate yourself uh, based on beliefs or personal beliefs or ideologies or like communities of thought. And so, what happens uh, in Texas is that. Um, uh, the idea that um, that you're always constantly sharing space with uh, people who are very different than you, um, and that everyone's always, in one way or another, um, at some point, othered in a certain kind of way, um, has always uh, it's something that finds its way into my work a lot. My work is also. Um, very much about communities uh, and communities in crisis and what what happens, uh, what are the sacrifices that that people must make um, to um, to bring a com community together, um, to heal, um, to solve whatever is uh, is putting everyone at the, the breaking point, I suppose. Um, and then finally, I would say, and this this is where it, for me um, somewhat begins to tie into disability. Um, in a lot of my work, I always have this idea that being in Texas, you always have to create work that can compete with football. <laughs> so, you know, for audiences, right? And saying that for me, it's really personal because um, when I was... I don't know how old was I, I think maybe 
eight or nine is when my family learned that, um, well, at the time, this is really complicated. At the time, we were told that I had CP. As I got older, I was told that it wasn't that. It was Hallman syndrome, which is an entirely different thing. Um, so we've always been in this weird space of not quite knowing what it was, but knowing that it was something. Um, and so for me, um, in ele from elementary school throughout the rest of my education, um, I, I gained this, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, a really kind of a inferiority complex about all kinds of physical activity uh, because I was always being looked at and always being judged and, and always feeling like I was being othered uh, when I was being othered. Um, and so I was able to discover uh, that through art, two things happen. Uh, oftentimes, uh, if I took an art class, like in uh, elementary school or junior high school, I could that art elective could actually get me out of gym. So like at one point I was taking violin classes. I did not know how to play. I still did not know how to play violin, it was horrible. I was, but I was only there because I could get out of gym. Uh, and I would take art classes and, and I was actually really good at drawing and stuff. But um, ultimately like art and drawing and, and acting and the performing arts um, somehow became um, uh, a way for me to kind of be a big kid on campus. I, I, that sounds stupid, but but I found myself in art because it was really um, a safe haven to the extent even that when I was in seventh grade, somehow I ended up in show choir, which was awesome and so much fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, but the arts has always been like a refuge um, and a safe house for me. Um, so, and I, I really don't know what, where I would be without it, especially in Texas where it's either like sports and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, basically I try to create plays that can compete with football. That's it. Fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Uh, I mean, so many of you have said so many great things. Um, I have uh, some specific questions for each of you. Um, and as I ask each person, uh, you know, other panelists are free to sort of chime in. Um, I apologize, uh, as I said, due to some audio issues, I'm on my phone. So if I don't see you wanting to chime in, please just unmute yourself and uh, name that you would like to, uh, uh, to join. But um, Jonathan, just stick with you. I think... Um, you know, you're talking about the various communities, right, and always coming into um, uh, uh, contact with people who might be different from you in various different ways, right? Um, which I think segues into this question I have for you, at least as a starter. Um, you know, the deaf disabled communities are incredibly intersectional, right? That intersectionality is plainly visible on this panel today. Um, I'm curious to hear how you um have navigated your various intersecting identities to date um and if there is uh one which tends to lead when it comes to creative discussions about your work or process right um to be really honest with you i i believe that partly the way that i've um navigated all of this and it's somewhat embarrassing to to admit to but is just the fact that um for so long i mean uh, once i hit like my mid-teens or what have you from that point on um it was so um kind of unknown exactly what i was struggling with to the point that after certain after a certain time, um, I just began in my mind, sounds weird, um, to just not address it or what have you. So it's it and it wasn't until um, actually it wasn't until uh, last September or at the beginning at when I really started like, thinking about the road that, um, 
that disability, particularly my disability, just plays in, in my life in general and in my work. Um, but it's, and it's slowly this process, of like you're wearing this veil, and but it's a really thick veil, and you're constantly like pulling like another, another piece of the veil off of the scales falling uh, from your eyes. But um, that's the place that I'm in now. And as I get older, oh, this is another piece of it that I forgot, is that, um, you know, when I was younger, I felt like it was also something that um, my um, that my body could kind of handle. I wasn't noticing my body as much because my body didn't have like the same kind of issues that I have now as I've gotten older. And so now as I get older, I'm like dealing with that. Uh, and particularly with Kalman syndrome, if it is in fact Kalman syndrome, like this is where I'm at, like what the hell is it? If it is in fact Kalman syndrome, which we all believe it is, um, that also has um, a huge impact on just like your skeletal development and that whole thing. So it makes so much sense with everything I'm dealing with. Uh, and I say all that um, to say that, for instance, last, uh, well, September 2019, at the convening, um, was my first time back in New York City. And I, uh, well, actually, I had been to New York earlier in the spring, but anyway. Um, and I started like noticing like uh, difficulties just like with mobility, and especially in New York City, we have like the subway system and what have you, and that whole thing. And I started uh, noticing this fear of the subway system just because of navigating steps. And what was really weird about that and difficult about that was the fact that like I went to school in New York uh, for undergrad, and some people may not think this, but but I love the New York subway system because I just the, the, the stations, I think they're just really, the architecture and everything, just always been so cool and so beautiful to me. And the idea of being in New York City and like avoiding the subways was just like absolutely heartbreaking to me. So I'm sorry, I just went on a long spiel and I, I apologize if <laughs> it was a really bad long spiel. <laughs> No, 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 no apology necessary at all. Thank you so much. Also, uh, I just want to, for folks, <clears throat> Jonathan referenced the national convening that Queen's Theatre held in 20, September of 2019, uh, where we had people from all over the country discussing issues at the nexus of theatre and disability. Um, and uh, I'm glad it was uh, illuminating for you, although, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but again, I don't think you're alone in you know, even I think uh, AA mentioned it to some degree, uh, uh, Brian mentioned it to some degree, I know I felt this. Again, the tension between how we're conditioned to sort of uh, disassociate from it or not acknowledge it at all, right? And then as we grow older, we say, oh, this is actually a huge part of who I am. Um, but again, we're told over and over, you know, you're just like everybody else or you're normal, blah, 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 which can be confusing, right? Um, and again, you can only be a, I guess, successful artist, if you're bringing your full humanity to, to your work, which includes, right, your otherness, your difference, your intersectionality, whatever that is, which includes disability. So I'm really interested in that, in that tension, right, uh, which so many have mentioned. Um, and maybe that will segue into this, this question for you, Evan, right? Um, and as I said, if anyone wants to chime in on anything that's been said, feel free. Um, but, um, there has been, um, uh, just focusing on Broadway, there's been an uptick in disability representation in the past few seasons. Uh, just some examples, Oklahoma, King Lear, Glass Menagerie, Children of a Lesser God, uh, et cetera. And while this is encouraging, uh, these are all examples of revivals and not original works. And um, Evan, I'm just curious how you would explain this particular phenomenon and do you think there's resistance to original work that deals with disability or contains disabled characters? I do think there's resistance. I think, uh, I, I think the phenomenon that you describe is largely positive, but I think that it has to do with comfort. I think it has to do with um, kind of 
putting and again you you're referring to broadway broadway is a commercial um perspective on theatrical creation and and um theatrical artistry um uh and while there's uh there are um uh, certainly in some of what you name, um, directors like Sam Gold and Daniel Fish and um, the, the coming from an off-Broadway aesthetic, even a downtown aesthetic um, uh, in, uh, and, and bringing, um, bringing these things to Broadway that doesn't, um, <laughs> doesn't completely negate the fact that it's a commercial endeavor. And I think, um, I think there's an element of see, seeing and experiencing disabled bodies on stage that um, I must have to, um, or at least I guess I recognize it as a um, uh, uh, ca calibrating calibrating the um, uh, uh, the fear or stigma about that. Um, because in a circumstance where you are coming into an Oklahoma and you're seeing Ali Stroker on stage, she's playing a character that has existed since the 30s, right? Um, and uh, there's something about that idea. Oh, I've seen Oklahoma before. Let's see how this director approaches it. Oh, there's a wheelchair user. I can take that in more easily, and 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 I'm not. I don't mean to paint with a broad brush um, uh, every audience member's experience, or a non-disabled audience member, or a, you know, we, we all have our identities, our experiences, and that kind of thing. So I'm I'm kind of playing the role of uh, the, the 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 more incurious uh, maybe um, person that might uh, come in and experience these things, but. Um, uh, uh, even even something like um, a Glass Menagerie, where in theory um, the role of Laura is is um, a character that um, has elements or overlaps with uh, with an idea of a disability identity. Again, people have experienced the Glass Menagerie before. Um, people have experienced Shakespeare before. Um, uh, and and uh, I think, though, looking back to the theatrical canon, um, almost um, uh, kind of becomes what is the familiar material that we can um, uh, kind of bit by little bit um, bring in different identity and experience and intersectionality and allow it to be received by a commercial audience in a way that doesn't shake things up too much. Um, and while I, I think it's really fantastic to, to incorporate even a little bit of shake up, I'm interested in the big shakeups, you know? And, and honestly, I think that um, can only happen and is only happening um, in, uh, in an off Broadway, downtown, um, you know, Art New York member theater realm, if it's happening at all. Um, and I, it excites me that there can be that these experiences on Broadway might be giving more permission to producers and artistic directors and, and artistic leaders to take that chance. And that um, ideally it might mean that people are becoming more brave to take chances that aren't the safe set in the canon. I've already experienced a part of this story and therefore I'm willing to go on the ride with um, this, uh, with a disabled identity as part of the aesthetic of that story. Uh, I hope that kind of brings us down the road of 
taking more chances and being more curious and being more imaginative and um, and allowing for, for these stories even more. I just want to uh, uh, jump in. And, yeah, go ahead, Brian. I was I actually going to go to you. Go. I think I, I think uh, Evan's absolutely right, and and one of the things that I think Evan just brushed upon, but I want to put a spotlight on is it's not just safe for audiences, it's safe for producers, especially if you're talking about those commercial uh, uh, commercial producing. Um, you know, Oklahoma is still going to make money, even if you have someone, even if you have one cast member out of the 50 that are on stage who is, uh, you know, doesn't fit the norm, right? And there's a reason why you're seeing a lot of this in, in you know, uh, revivals is that these stories are safe and the, um, uh, it's a safe sorry, introduction I to intersection. I just want to, Sorry, Brian. I, I want you to keep going, but by safe, do you mean like sort of tried and true? Like tried as Evan true. said, like they will make money, you know, yeah. blah, blah, blah. They are commercially more a lot, I mean, they're commercially a lot more safe than a new play uh, or a play that's, you know, has themes that might, um, that are more at risk of alienating or distancing or at least not an audience not identifying with. I think that's the biggest thing and uh, for, for a commercial producer to consider. And hopefully, like Evan said, uh, uh, once those waters have been tested, that that, that allows uh, an open door to more adventurous storytelling, more risky storytelling, more uh, focused storytelling. And what, is that, what, what does that storytelling look like to you? I'm just curious if you can define or articulate that. Uh, or what would you like it to look like, even if it's aspirational? just more challenging as far as um, uh, whose perspective we're seeing these stories through and who is representing these stories on stage. Uh, more challenging, more adventurous, uh, more putting spotlights on things that might make people uncomfortable, that might uh, challenge who they think they are uh, and challenge how they have gone through the world, either by not seeing certain people, by uh, you know making assumptions about certain people or certain groups of people, uh, and it, it all goes back to what I touched on earlier: is, is creating a, a stronger sense of empathy in uh, uh, and finding ways to do that through through our medium. Cool, great. I know I'm. <clears throat> Brian, just to stay stay with you again. I, if you just look at this Zoom conversation, you know we've got live captioning, we've got ASL interpretation, we've got audit. We you know we audit, we self described. Um, you know th these things, these accoutrements around uh, accessibility, right? Are are what enable greater participation, right, from various members of various communities, right, to enjoy theater live arts, et cetera. Um, I, <clears throat> I know I asked you this uh, sort of in loose form in our, in our planning call, but I was curious if your work at Victory Gardens, if there's a particular philosophy around uh, accessibility and if there's any conversation about um, how these things might be integrated into a performance Right in an artistic, artful way, rather than something that might, you know, take take people out of the enjoyment, right, uh, 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 of the uh, uh, of the event itself. Um, and if you could just speak on that, uh, to a point, I, I'd just like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, 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 my philosophy at Victory Gardens as access coordinator is to not force anyone to need to identify themselves as needing services or having a disability. Uh, that anyone with, with any sort of need can come into any performance and not, and not need to ask for help or not need to uh, figure out if the services they require uh, or rely on are offered on the dates that they can see the show. Um, that we provide access for all all the time, or as much as, as we can uh, logistically and financially provide. Uh, so 
and and so there's there's two things that I'm I'm working on and pushing, and one is is audience access um, for you know persons with uh, limited mobility or who are deaf or hard of hearing or who are blind or low vision, um, and as far as uh, and the other side is artist access too, and not just access for our artists backstage, but also uh, access for artists to, act, especially actors, access for those actors to be able to go into auditions and feel like they have the confidence to go out for those roles. So, you know, we offer acting classes through some of our teaching artists and, and making sure that we have scholarships available uh, for actors with disabilities and uh, writing opportunities for writers with disabilities, uh, uh, because it's going to be hard to authentically tell these stories if we don't have artists uh, through which to tell them. Um, and so, so those are the two fronts I'm working on. And as far as the uh, access services side goes, as you mentioned, we have captioning and ASL interpretation uh, is to make them as seamless and integrated into the production as possible. And that is uh, sort of the, the most difficult push because not only does it require uh, financial resources, if you're talking about things like um, uh, an ASL shadow cast, right? Or, uh, uh, or, or just buy-in, an investment from the beginning, from the director, from the artistic director, from the managing director, from the scenic designers, uh, to have those conversations uh, from the beginning. How are we going to integrate captions in a way that doesn't force people who rely on them to sort of ping pong between screens or, you know, how can we find ways to integrate them into the aesthetics of the set? Uh, you know, how can we make this experience as integrated as possible so that not only uh, for the audience members who rely on those services, it is, it feels like it is included in the storytelling of the show, uh, but also for uh, people who don't rely on those services that they aren't necessarily uh, distracted or turned off and you know that's not necessarily our problem but it's uh, it's something that um, uh, you know having subscribers and, and things like that we do need to be a little bit sensitive towards so that's that's uh, what we're trying our best to do you mean uh, I'm sorry sensitive in 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 what way um, you know Every once in a while, we do get uh, comments about captions that they're distracting, or comments that the ASL interpreters they're they're distracting. And you know, you have uh, uh, directors and scenic designers who may be resistant. I, I actually haven't heard anyone say this, so uh, uh, this may just be me creating this in my head. Of um, you know, directors and scenic designers, you know, pushing back on integrated captions or or an ASL shadow cast because it's not necessarily uh, it is distracting to the storytelling that they're trying to put on stage. Um, uh, so th those are the kinds of things I'm, I'm referring to. Gotcha. Yeah. Again, I feel like it's what do we uh, Evan, I'm sorry, I think you mentioned something akin to this, uh, right? But like, maybe it was you forgive me, but like, why I'm interested in this conversation is I feel like artistic solution solutions imaginative solutions are always like producers theater people are some of the smartest coolest most imaginative sexiest people i know right in all ways um right and so it's kind of it boggles my mind that uh people are resistant to finding imaginative solutions so it's again it's i'm gonna go back to this word tension of like i love uh Jonathan, about how you say challenging producers, right? Um, like writing, baking it into your plays in some way, whether you're doing this or not, right? But like writing that in, so it has to be adhered to because that's the play, right? Um, I think there might be, again, this is just something people are thinking of more and more, uh, writers, you know, I think it's a relatively new concept to have playwrights, disabled or non-disabled to write this character must be disabled, this character must be non-binary, this character, you know, because then it is actually essential that that, that casting must be adhered to because um, it's what the playwright demands, yeah? Otherwise the production can't be 
done fully or can be can suffer repercussions right um so yeah again i don't know i don't know what the answer is like, i'm just curious about the question um does anyone have i'm just curious if anyone else in, uh, on this panel has any uh ideas, thoughts on, on that particular topic about sort of the artistic integration of all of these services and accoutrements. I mean, I feel like, you know, in general, if you build it, they will come. Like the more we show them that it's not an encumbrance and actually can add to the artistry itself. Um, there's so many creative ways of doing captioning that feed right into the storytelling that actually assist the storytelling. Um, and that's just one example of, you know, the many different services you know, that we that we need to make these shows accessible. Um, so again, I mean, I think you're totally, you know, spot on with just like with casting, you know, as a playwright, and I have the power to say you must cast a non-binary person, you must cast a disabled person. Um, as a playwright, I again have the power to say you must, you know, this is integral to the script, you must do this. Um, and it's been done before, kind of. I mean, even Tennessee Williams in his stage directions in The Glass Menagerie has projections. So, you know, people use technology all the time, have always been in a variety of ways that assist storytelling. And sure, I mean, a lot of directors don't listen to that when they do The Glass Menagerie. But, you know, now, you know, as a, as a modern living playwright, we have, you know, and theater creators, we have the opportunity to, to lead by example and show that we can do that. And as directors too, you know, just put it in and see what happens. Yeah, no, that's great. I think, AA, thanks for um, chiming in. I, my next question is actually for you. Um, <clears throat> you've been in professional situations where I'm sure you were the only disabled person in the room uh, and where the creative team has been predominantly disabled. Um, and I was just curious, based on your experience, if there are any distinct differences between the two scenarios? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the short answer is no. I mean, it's still a room, right? Like we're still making a show, we're still working together, we're still collaborating. Um, but the long answer is yes. I mean, in the sense that I said, just like in my work, my disability um, is in everything I do. Um, even the shows that I don't think are inherently about being disabled, always when I look back, I realize, oh, wait a minute, it, they still are, you know, there's still this one theme, you know, whether it's body autonomy or, um, yeah, again, normalcy, the way that you present other people, the way people perceive you, like there is always a link. Um, and that felt true in the room as well. Um, so yeah, Greg and I worked on um, a show at La Jolla Playhouse, Emily Driver's Great Race Through Time and Space, uh, which was their 2020 pop tour last year, and the entire um, production team was disabled. Um, and that was the first time I had been in a room like that. Um, and there were a lot of really cool moments where, you know, um, like at least three of us had CP and that never happens. You know, you're never around that many disabled people, um, no less so many people with the same disability. Um, so there was more of an understanding of like, you know, right now no one can walk and, and that's okay, you know? Um, and and uh, there was more grace, I guess I will say. There was more grace and understanding inherently of intersectionality and of different needs that people in the room um, are going to have, um, even though it was still production. It was still run, you know, just like the way any other room would be. We had, you know, the same rehearsal schedule that anyone else would have had, um, which is another thing to think about, you know, why do we structure our rehearsal and tech processes the ways that we do? Can we make that more accessible? Does it all have to be, you know, like when we have days of 10 out of 12, like is, that's not really accessible for all people. Um, so, you know, to put a pin in that, like it doesn't all have to be the same. Like, you know, we have to question why we're doing the conventions we're doing, but at the end of the day, like a show is a show. We're all collaborators, we're all working together. And as long as there is grace, understanding, and respect for everyone's needs, uh, there's no reason why every room can't be as you know graceful and loving as as that one was. But do you think that I love that you use the term grace? Do you think that that <clears throat> that was set up because of the bodies and the neurologies, right? Um, that inhabited that space, like I mean, that. Probably. Yeah, you know, yeah. and we had shared experiences that, you know, when you're the only disabled person in a room or the only non-binary person in a room, people don't understand because it's outside of their experience. And it's, you know, goes back to empathy, as Brian was, Brian was saying, um, you know, it's sad that people sometimes think that they can't empathize 
you know, with people or, or understand where they're coming from or either recognize that, hey, maybe someone needs something right now. Like, I don't know, maybe I need to get up and stretch in the middle of rehearsal and, and that's okay, you know? Um, so I think as a society, definitely generationally, I'm, I'm noticing at least a shift towards more empathy for more types of people and more different types of people. But certainly in that room at La Jolla, um, inherently because we all have some shared experiences and some different experiences, right? Like so many different types of people are disabled. It's such a huge category. There's so many different types of disabilities. Um, what was beautiful about it though, was that we could all come together, you know, because we all know what it's like to be the only person in the room. Um, we could understand, even if we didn't have the exact same experiences as everyone else, um, at least we had that one unifying experience in common. And so we could work to understand each other better. That's great. Um, it's interesting that you, <clears throat> A, you mentioned that, sorry, Jonathan, did you want to say something? Um, I just wanted to say that, um, the idea that when, when you think of it in terms of all the many different people who have uh, disabilities and are dis, uh, differently abled in so many uh, various types of ways, um, that also means that they have family members and friends and, and partners, uh, and in some cases, caregivers, so many different people uh, in their lives and in their corners. Uh, who love them and who are great advocates for them, who I feel like are also um, uh, hungry to see representation as well. And I oftentimes feel like, uh, as just from a, coming from a playwriting stand, standpoint in general, I just oftentimes feel like uh, producers or theaters will use the audience excuse as a way of masking whatever fears or insecurities or challenges or what have you that they uh, have for a certain project or a certain idea. Um, but I believe that in actuality, um, audiences are much more um, They're much more, um, I don't want to say the word accepting because accepting feels like there's something wrong, that that's the wrong way word to use. But I, I do feel that um, audiences are ready. Uh, I feel like uh, they're open. I feel like there's no hang, there's no real hang ups because there's no real hang up to have, but the hang up is on the other side. You know what I mean? Uh, and so I think that that's the, the issue. Uh, oftentimes I feel like that that's the issue to address. And when I hear uh, anything related to, uh, for instance, like if a producer hears that, oh, you know, there were like five audience, audience members that had an issue with captioning, you know, all of a sudden those five audience members for the producer becomes like our entire audience has an issue with captioning. And it's like, no, it's five people. You know what I mean? It's like if 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 someone said, oh my God, like five people have an issue with Beyonce, it's not all of a sudden like nobody's gonna go to a Beyonce concert because five people have an issue with Beyonce. I mean it's that kind of thing. So I'm just anyway, that that that's 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 my statement. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. I totally agree with that. <laughs> I fully agree with it. And I, I feel like that also goes into, you know, it's an excuse, exactly. And it uh, just because the people on stage look different from you doesn't mean that the things that they're experiencing are different also, right? Like we're writing about very universal experiences. And frankly, I think actually most people probably know what it's like to be the only person in one specific aspect of their identity in a given room, you know? So I think if people could just uh, expand expand uh, their empathy a little bit. And also, yeah, I agree that, uh, you know, it's not as difficult as it seems, right? Um, and I, and we are seeing more of that, so. Yeah, it's not something that's, uh, just like with storytelling, we don't want to be catering to our audiences. We want to be leading them. We want to be stretching them. We want to be uh, pushing them in ways where they can can grow as, you know, community members and people. And, and I think that's, I agree, that's, we, we do need to start doing that with access as well. And 
you know, if some people don't like it, well, they can just see it another night. They can look on our calendar and say, oh, that's the access performance. Uh, the captioning really distracts me, so I'll just go on Saturday instead of Friday. And that, that's fine. That they can do that. But yeah, I agree that, that we need to be pushing people just like we're doing, we're just like we're pushing people with, with storytelling. I feel like that's, a, that's such a great point, Brian, because like, as writers and directors, um, just the baseline right there, like we have to convince a producer, an artistic director that our, that our, the story that we're interested in telling it has value and ha, um, it could, could be appealing to an audience. Well, you know, whether we're looking at that from a commercial perspective or we're looking at that from, um, you know, kind of a, the, uh, the certain uh, regional community or uh, New York community or places that we, that we all, um, um, live and work and and are producing and I feel like um, uh, I feel like the um, the ideal scenario is that the element of convincing is only about the art and the storytelling um, but then we do recognize that there is an element of access accessibility and and I, I thought it um humorously ridiculous greg that um uh, in in when you quoted um you know oh uh, access that's just about ramp um because it's like i mean it's almost like saying um oh uh it, you know um bring bringing artists in that's 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 just about being sure that the doorknob works on the rehearsal studio or something you know it's like no there's so much more going on than that um but but i do feel like there's there's an element of importance in um finding the ways to um uh, uh kind of zero out <laughs> zero factor the um uh, the 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 cost element and the um, kind of some of these elements of accessibility of inclusion of um, making the space working and available for people with disabilities particularly physical dis disabilities um, that um, uh, that it's a lot easier to convince about the storytelling if some of those elements don't seem like they're their weights hanging on the idea of a production of the story that you're there to share, and I and I still think that there's there are complicated, um, uh, you know, so much of this like everything is about money and about um, uh, and and about a willingness, you know, and sometimes the it's hard to convince uh, someone to have willingness. What do you, what do you think would help? With that convincing, I mean, is there any besides like the one-to-one -one conversation? Is there any? I have some ideas, but I'm just curious. Um, do you know, like, is there any, like from in a broader sense or a collective sense? Do you think? What do you think will help with that convincing? Is it just a matter of like doing it and presenting these stories over and over and over and over and over again, right? So people see it, have exposure to it, and understand it. Uh, what is it? I'm just anybody. Yeah, I I, I would just say. Um, briefly i think uh, i don't know exactly but i do think there is a top-down element and a bottom-up element um the top down is um places that have money or granting organizations or um you know opportunities for um a big chunk of change to be available for um uh to d disseminate among theater companies to that specifies um, uh, the telling of these stories and, and that those resources could go towards that. And I also feel like, um, like anything, it, it also is going to be about individual artists, about um, particular storytelling and about um, uh, the, uh, essentially, um, uh, a form of story, either it being a director's vision for a production, uh, a playwright's particular perspective and the storytelling that is inclusive in, in the play that they're sharing 
and someone wanting to take a chance on that. Um, so I, I, I guess I feel like uh, it works from both directions or ideally can um, uh, uh, find its way towards working um, from the top down and the bottom up. Uh, I want to include a um, section of people that were in the middle of what everyone talked about between, you know, funders and, and artists is, is theater management, artistic directors, managing directors to be able to say, yeah, we're going to do this show. I know it's going to cost, you know, if we're doing five shows, it's, it's going to, you know, take up 30, 35% of the budget because we need an ASL interpreter in the room or we need, you know, this and this and this in order to uh, facilitate these artists doing what they need to do, but having that buy-in from the artistic director, from the managing director, from the board of the theater to say, yes, we're going to do this, we're really excited to do this, and we're going to do what we can to make it happen, uh, uh, that's that's a big chunk of, of that hierarchy of, of institutional buy-in, of just general buy-in and investment, not only financial investment, but also artistic uh, and personal investment. I think uh, something else that I'm noticing personally is that oftentimes I'm finding that producers or theaters or whoever it is that is, you know, they from above were uh, making the decisions to produce work by disabled artists, non-binary artists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I find that folks these days are often finding the concept of inclusivity sexy, but when they actually hear more about it, they start to get a little scared. They don't realize everything that it might entail, how it will be different from other productions they've had, whether in subject matter or in you know making um, accessible productions and design, et cetera, et cetera, um, and you know that's that's a struggle, right? Uh, when when folks say yes to something and then are are uh, coming up against the reality of what that could mean, um, but it's fear based, and usually I've found that um, you know once you show them that it's okay and that audiences are still gonna love it and that it's worth it, you know, um, they they tend to calm down. Uh, sometimes that involves you know sneaking things in somewhat, you know, like backdoor accessibility or, or backdoor inclusivity, backdoor intersectionality. Um, but whatever, you, you know, you need to do or we need to do in order to make it not seem like a scary thing. And then, I mean, you know, there's always a little hand holding along the way, but you know, you still, if you're committed to making it happen, you can, you can make it happen. And once they see the reaction, it's, it usually tends to be worth it. So I just hope that with time, more people will We'll see that and then they won't be scared, you know? Yeah, I think that goes to what Jonathan said about, you know, audiences, it's the audiences. The audiences are ready, almost hungry for new narratives, new stories, like things that reflect our world today, right? I mean, hold, should we, is it our job to hold the mirror up to nature and reflect who is in our communities, various communities, who's in our country, right? The issues that we're having. Um, I think it's really great. I mean, we've been talking. Um, we've got about 15 minutes or a little less before we open to questions, but we've been talking a lot of sort of institutional resistance or barriers. And uh, I just, Evan, to circle back to what you were saying originally, uh, this might be a little thin, but again, like, again, we're obviously the focus is on disability here, but you brought up initially, like, um, you are, you know, as a disabled director, you, you are able to direct anything. You know, uh, same is true with anyone on this panel. You could direct or potentially write about anything that that is to your fancy or floats your boat, right? Um, and I'm I'm wondering, like, again, if we could just talk about that for a bit, uh, how you might navigate that, um, and if there's any, is there any personal resistance? for telling those kind of stories or feeling dr being driven into that lane. Just curious about that. Yeah, resistance to, well, I, I, I mean, I think uh, part, part of what you're talking about is, um, uh, is kind of a, a single vision or kind of a tunnel vision expectation of individual individuals, any individual to to be one thing or one primary thing, you know, um, and and I feel like and any and uh, disability or not disability, um, uh, any director writer um, is coming to their storytelling with a particular identity that is so many shades of so many different things, um, and and uh, and I feel like part of what you're talking about. I mean, I I guess. 
my personal experience of um, of honestly just getting work or creating work um, being I, I, I honestly, I can't point to you any work that I've done in the last four or five years that um, wasn't either specifically, there's, there's a play or a story that has disability elements or themes. Let's call up Evan and see if he would be available to direct. Um, other than projects that I have kind of built and created for myself, which have um, elements of, of um, stories of underrepresented experiences and have elements of um, how do I see or um, pursue this, uh, the, this idea for, for a production of an Annie Baker play or for a classic musical, right? Um, uh, through my eyes, okay, well, that's gonna have an element of physical life and experience. And I'm going to incorporate that in the way that is most appropriate and, and best explores kind of my perspective on this story. Um, but I do feel like there's, if it's not an assumption, it's a, again, kind of playing in a, an, a, a realm of limited imagination to um, to reach out to me for that production of this other play that doesn't necessarily have any element of disability within it you know um, and 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 frankly to um, recognize my my own particular privilege and experience as um, to straight white male, right? Um, the in a in a way the the um, the curiosity about any in intersectionality that exists within my own identity disability is kind of the the the, the aesthetic that's at the forefront, you know the the thing that comes into the room first, um, and uh, literally, right? literally, yeah. yeah. And I and and I'd love for that to um, for the, for the idea that I can uh, as a director or as a writer, I can direct anything. Um, for that to be more than just an idea and a quaint saying for that to actually be um, be able to be in practice in, in the work that I do. And I'm, and I, I'm not there yet um, because I'm still building a career and meeting people and, and um, trying to get people curious about the storytelling that I have to share, which is multifaceted. Just curious if anybody else has any thoughts on that particular topic. No. I mean, I, I guess as a as a writer, uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's a little bit easier because then I can always write a different play. I don't know that that focuses on another aspect of of my identity. Um, I do find that each play tends to focus on a different you know part of myself, uh, even if it's not directly. I mean, of course, if it's not directly about me, um, but just, you know, it's, it's what am I, what am I questioning? What am I curious about? What do I want to see on stage? Um, and sometimes that explicitly has to do with disability and sometimes it doesn't. Um, now, I don't know, ask me in five years from now, uh, when I have more of a, you know, a longer career, like is most of my, the stuff that I'm writing uh, disability based um, and maybe I'll have a, I have a different answer for you. You know, I'm still pretty young. So we're, seeing where things go. Um, but I don't know, I just feel like uh, it is always interesting to see what folks are curious to hear you talk about or direct or, or present to them. And then it's also interesting to see the ways that that um, 
is what, you know, how that goes with you and what you're curious about and interested in. Um, and of course, sometimes like we need to take a gig and we'll do it even if it's not something that is necessarily uh, exactly what we're questioning or interests us. But I find in those instances, again, like you can usually find some way to feed in some of, you know, something that you are questioning into it. Um, but it is a good question and it is, yeah, I mean, uh, to, to date, most of pretty much all of my professional work has been uh, through the disability community. So, um, you know, I find that to be a huge privilege. I'm, I feel very lucky. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Cause obviously we have so many stories to tell. Um, and yes, they will all inherently be disabled because we are disabled, but they, they, you know, don't all necessarily have to, for example, be literally about disability history as, as our play was Greg. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Understood. Hey, I also think you brought up, <clears throat> you know, uh, in the, in the process in La Jolla, right. A lot of it was the first time that like, oh my gosh, I'm around six other disabled people. That is the most disabled people I've been around ever, right? Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that about the dis people from outside the disability community don't understand that the community or communities with some few exceptions are not necessarily cohesive, real, felt, experienced things, right? Like art has brought me a sense of community in my adult life. You know, uh, theater has brought me a sense of that community. And maybe that ties back to, well, again, why the creation of works is so important, right? Stories that deal with these experiences, these narratives, right? Um, maybe that's why um, revivals work, right? Uh, because again, it's, you're starting to see an integration. And I think historically, uh, other uh, communities of color or whatnot have used revivals to implant themselves, to write, to weave themselves into the narrative and live stream of, uh, of American history and culture, right? Uh, through the theater, right? And through the commercial theater. Um, but again, it's just like, maybe we just haven't had enough time to be in space together. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Definitely, it's definitely interesting. And I feel like, uh, I mean, look we'll we'll see what we'll see what happens right it's uh this is a it's a process and uh like jonathan said earlier you know most people know a disabled person or close to a disabled person uh and so this isn't you know so foreign to them it's just now we just have to get us on on stage right um yeah that's yeah totally again what is uh i think this is again people do know people right everybody knows somebody we could say that, and at some, and if disability is just natural human variance, right? Disability, will, everyone will encounter disability in some way, shape, or form in their life, right? Whether you know through uh, on a long enough timeline, yeah. But I guess can we, a fear and anxiety has come up a little bit, right? Uh, and maybe we don't have time to get into this in three minutes, <laughs> you know. But I, I'm just curious about like what. What is inherently fear-inducing, anxiety-inducing about disability, right? Is it a reminder of one's own mortality? Is it a reminder of one's vulnerability? I think to some extent, yes. But also historically, any I, I think like a performative history is solely and uniquely ours as disabled people. We have a huge, huge, long, long history of being on stage whether willfully or otherwise, right? And that can be through the freak show, through other areas of performance, uh, through anatomy theater being put on display. Do you know what I mean? So I think there's, there's I don't know, I just feel there's some, theater in particular, right, is an art form that is inherently ours. And by ours, I mean disabled, deaf and disabled communities, right? Um, and I feel like somehow we've gotten away from that. And I'm really interested in like leaning into that, right? And getting back to that sort of sense of who we are as people and where that sort of collective identity and power was um, on stage, right? Um, I don't know. And maybe that's, I don't know. There, I'm seeing that hope for the, I'm seeing that hope in, in this panel, right? And, and in others, but yeah, sorry. Big thought, but. Greg, I was just going to say, I feel like there's an, there's an element of that, that um, like <laughs> producers, artistic leaders, I feel like, <sighs> do we have to encourage them? If so, I encourage 
you pro producers and artistic leaders to like dig into that fear and um, kind of question why that, why that fear sits in your stomach somewhere and wrestle with it and um, uh, and recognize maybe the, the, the value of that, you know? Like give yourself the chance of saying, um, there's something about this that unsettles me. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe that's a thing that I would be really interested in um, communicating with um, artists who have had individual experiences that are unfamiliar to me and putting those stories in front of an audience so that they can wrestle with that fear and they can kind of dig into what, what, what is unsettling about an experience of, um, you know, uh, an aesthetic experience, uh, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, grappling with your own um, physical, um, <laughs> the kind of tenuous physical nature of being humans and living in bodies, you know? Um, I, I, so, so many of those elements excite me and I think they maybe excite me for the same reason that they scare others. Um, and I'd love to kind of find the way that those two things meet, you know, um, and, yeah. and, and to a degree, uh, it's almost, I think, maybe encouraging leaders and people in a space to give voice to this story, give money to this story, give space to this story, give their stages to this story, um, I'd, I'd kind of instill in those folks an element of responsibility. It's, if they feel responsible to tell stories of, of um, uh, experiences of people of color, of gender differences, of sexuality differences, of geographical differences, of class differences, then there should be a built-in responsibility also to tell stories of physical differences. And, um, and uh, having those stories come from the voices of disabled artists. And of course, Evan, disability encompasses all those categories, which you mentioned. Sure does. And yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to get to questions. And uh, just a reminder, if folks do have questions, um, you can input into the Q&A. But I just wanted to, funnily enough, uh, my wife is a teacher at LaGuardia High School for the Performing Arts. Uh, she is going to direct Coney Island by uh, Chuck Mee, uh, right? Uh, disabled playwright. Um, very well known, successful playwright. Um, but uh, so we were watching a documentary on Coney Island, yeah, last night um, by uh, Rick Burns, who I think is related to Ken Burns, but not necessarily. But shot in that same style. Uh, I highly recommend it if you can find it. Um, but uh, there was a, a, a sort of Coney Island uh, denizen there who I think had been involved with a lot of stuff, and he said. Uh, Coney Island was almost an assault on the senses, right? But it gave people an opportunity to experience something other, new, dangerous, right? Terribly and horribly alive. And he said, the first step is to get excitement in the air. Yeah, and I think there's something about our very presences, uh, in particular, if you have a visible, uh, visible physical disability, right? Gets excitement in the air it incites and it gauges and engages the senses in a new way, right? And I think that's ultimately what we want to do with theater. And I think any aesthetic choice we make, right? If aesthetics is all about engaging the senses on all levels, yeah? There's, I just feel like there's, there's something about our inherent experiences that can be harnessed, right? I think to great theatrical effect. Again, I don't have all the answers, but I think what we're, I don't have any answers really, but what our job as artists is to do is ask those questions and put those questions into practice and make it an art of flesh and blood. That's what theater is. There's no celluloid barrier. We are an art of flesh and blood, right? There are real people up there living, breathing. You know, there have been studies where heartbeats literally regulate in theater when people are watching a show. I just think that is so beautiful 
right? And regardless of your background, ability, whatever, right? Everyone heart, everyone, everyone's got a human heart and will beat and regulate and have a shared experience in the theater. So, yeah, I don't know. Let's, let's keep talking. Let's figure it out, you know? Um, I just oh, think it's really Greg, exciting. Yeah. Greg, I was just going to say, I'm, I won't let you off the hook to say that you don't have any answers because I feel like the value that you bring to this space, um, what, not only having these conversations and the work that you do through Queen's Theater, but also um, connecting your company and, and the Lark and giving uh, opportunity and voice to writers and and uh, uh, these 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 are these are ways of lifting that 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 voice and that um, you know the the thrill that can come from sharing disability stories. So I'm, I just would 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 point to not selling yourself short in the way that. Um, the way that you have kept these conversations in in the realm of 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 our professional theater community. Well, thanks, Evan. I appreciate it. And again, I, I, thank you. Um, uh, I try to proceed with humbleness and gratitude in all things. I'm not always successful, but again, I'm, what has enabled this conversation? Theater art has enabled this conversation. Do you know, art and theater has enabled me to meet all of you on this call, learn more about you, get interested and excited about you, you know, excited about your work and share that work out with a larger, with a larger audience. That, that is the power that I'm really excited and interested in. And I think that's why I keep doing, <laughs> why uh, I do what I do despite, you know, despite, 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 so. Thank you, thank you all. Um, I see, I'm gonna move to the, thank you all. Thank you all, that was, a, there's only so much we can cover in that, you know, 85, 80, you know, minutes or so, um, but a really thrilling conversation. And I just wanna remind people, well, from my own personal note, I have, until today, I have never engaged in a conversation of this nature. So I just wanna thank Queens Theater in Art New York for uh, creating the space and enabling this conversation to occur. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, cool. So, um, any more questions? Just, uh, let them come folks. Um, so from Tucker, uh, this is a, to the group. Um, how do you deconstruct the stigma that views disabled performances as not quote unquote professional performances? Anybody wants to jump in on that? I guess I have a question. Uh, what does disabled performances mean, right? Does this mean an uh -huh. performance? Uh, does this mean uh, a performance about uh, disabled folks, a uh, performance with uh, disabled actors and performers? Um, yeah, I don't know. That's such a, a broad a broad statement. Um, I mean, they, I, I don't know. In my experience, they just have been professional because they've been done at professional theaters uh, with a professional crew and with professional actors. And I think that inherently makes it professional. Um, but I'm curious to hear more about, I guess, what you, what you folks think that might mean, or Tucker, if you're still there and want to clarify a little bit. Uh, yeah. Or and yeah. Like what, what makes, like, what do we define as professional uh, performance? And I think um, if I can sort of assume what you're asking by the question is, is I think that part of it is, uh, at least initially, um, working to ensure that the themes and the narrative are uh, not so disabled focused, but they are human focused, that they are, uh, that they touch on things that even though we or, you know, the director or the writer is experiencing as a disabled person as they move through this world, but it all comes down to those core human elements of of uh, that we all share. For example, Richard III is a play about someone who never felt like he was seen for who he is, or or um, always looked like, always felt like he was looked down upon. And it, the story is about him fighting to be seen, not necessarily in a great way. But uh, and you know, Glass Menagerie is something we brought up earlier. Is is you know, a play about a, a mother's a mother's attempt to reconcile with disability through her daughter and then how that does or does not go well. I mean, the, that the stories are all about the human things that we both share, interacting with each other every day that we are all struggling with and finding those 
um, universal uh, core elements of those and you know weaving them into the narrative into other characters into the relationships with other characters into uh, uh, and I think that's probably if if I'm assuming that question if I'm assuming correctly about that question is is how to broaden that storytelling to make it more attractive or to make it more connecting to everyone. So I, I agree with you, Brian, to some extent. And I think, um, well, I'll just, from my own experience, I uh, produced a workshop of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream uh, a few years ago, uh, originally in 2015, and then actually did it at Queen's Theater in 2017, um, called Spirits of Other Sort. It was integrated cast of uh, physically disabled, intellectually disabled, and non-disabled actors, right? And each represented the three worlds. Disabled, uh, physically disabled were uh, of the fairy world, uh, intellectually disabled were of the room mechanicals um, and the, the lovers were um, uh, non-disabled. And when we first presented it in 2015, one of the feedback questions we got, or one of the, some feedback I, I was told secondhand by the audience was that the people really liked the professional actors. And what they meant by that was the non-disabled actors. So, and the, uh, again, there were in that, in that entire ensemble, there was, there were people, there were people who were disabled who had been to grad schools and who had been, uh, who had worked with Chicago Shake. I mean, had done like worked at OSF, like done all, all kinds of stuff, you know, it was, it was a big mix. While there were people who had limited experience, the, the perception of this particular audience member was that everyone who's disabled in that production is a quote unquote, is, is non-professional or, or amateur, which is not the case, you know? And that, again, that was just really illuminating and telling. So uh, uh, Tucker, that might be what, <clears throat> what I, that's just something that I, that I felt and dealt with, uh, you know, I, I think, um, I think it's a complicated question because I don't think, uh, maybe it has to do with the, the, the trope that is slowly being dismantled, right? But you, you very rarely see a disabled person played by a disabled person. Uh, do you know, and that is changing uh, slowly but surely, even though there have been very recent examples uh, in Hollywood film and television where we're still fighting that and confronting that. But again, I think uh, maybe theater for me anyway, it's always been the tip of the spear to sort of change perception, right? And, and share narratives and say, we, we have been here. We, have, we are part of the American experience. We, we participate and we have been participating for, for however long. But I think again, the, the only way to do that is, I think it's multifaceted, right? You have to look at training and opportunity. And then you have to look at uh, once people do get that, training what up what opportunities are available to them um but it's, it's a very it's a very multifaceted layered uh intense uh question yeah but tucker if you have any uh clarification on that and want to add feel free we've actually got some clarification so tucker responds i mean performances from professional disabled actors writers directors etc at breaking through barrier at theater breaking through barriers in the past we've experienced people calling our work not professional even though we were a professional off-Broadway company that embraces both disabled and able-bodied people. And Becky also responds, CoLab has had similar experiences where funders don't support the work because they only fund professional theater. And yeah, Brian, do you have anything, what do you, do you have anything, do you know, to add on Tucker's clarification or Becky's comment? Uh, maybe. Evan seems like he has something to say right away. So let's go to him first. Go ahead, right, of course. Uh, now, I guess all I would say is, um, to a degree, it does still feel like there needs to be the professional stamp on something in the form of a non-disabled actor who people may have seen more often on stage because there are more opportunities possibly for that non-disabled actor. Um, a, uh, a named theater company who is not known for, particularly for producing disability stories because 
then the perspective is, oh, this is a company that's done work that has, you know, um, it built a name for itself in the community. I mean, it's more quote unquote accepted, you know, and and um, uh, it, it has always struck me that the um, one of the roots towards um, professionally working known disabled actors, um, someone finding their way to that point, and um, you know, uh, where 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 are our disabled movie stars? They're really not out there, um, and the, you know, the ones that we can name in the last half century say Christopher Reeve or Michael J. Fox, you know, came to dis uh, disability in their lifetime. And, and um, there's Peter uh, Dinklage. I gotta, gotta give props to Dinklage. No, I mean, Marley um, uh, but I, but I guess the, it would be lovely if we could find our way to the, uh, out of those exceptions to you know the the, the 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 people that have been able to go through the gauntlet and and actually make a name for themselves um uh that it didn't that it didn't take the um kind of stamp of approval from an established organization uh uh, uh, uh collaborators that are non-disabled that um have um been uh, more full, fully seen and had experiences in uh, in the in their given artistic communities and on and on, um, uh, but I don't know how we get there. I don't know. I, it's something that I'm recognizing, but I don't know what the solution is. I I have, I have a theory. Oh, Brian, go ahead. Did you? Oh, say I was just going to say, in, in response to Evan's question at the end, is is uh, and for to, to respond to Tucker and Becky is uh, to be confrontational about it, and I don't necessarily mean aggressively confrontational, but just to ask, well what makes us not professional we're we're paying actor stipends or or paying them weekly you know we're paying them more than than some other small theaters in town are we're uh you know we're using equity actors we're doing all this like what 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 about us makes you think we're not professional and let them try to answer that question and and maybe that causes some conflict within themselves or something like that but uh but to stand up for your declaration and your belief and, and your right that you are that you are a professional company and, and approach that with confidence uh and hopefully that hopefully those funders who denied funding previously might go home and think about it for a day a week a month a year and next uh next funding round might say hey you know what let's do it maybe hopefully Totally. I love that, Brian. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, I have a theory about just on to, to riffing on this particular topic or all those people you mentioned, I think, um, let's say Christopher Reeves, Marley Matlin, Peter Dinklage, I think their entry point to celebrity notoriety, let's say, right, uh, uh, was through characters where there was a particular integration of disability and character, right? So Peter Dinklage, obviously like Game of Thrones is playing a, a, a person who matches his particular physicality. Marley Matlin, Children of Lesser God and later the West Wing, like she was playing, uh, you know, particular deaf individual. Christopher Reeves, the only project I really know that he did post paralysis was Rear Window, uh, like a remake of Rear Window. I could be wrong, but right, there were other things. But again, that was the project he picked, you know, uh, to produce and promote. And, and I think uh, I saw a documentary about that or a little making of thing. And he actually demanded that there's a scene where his ventilator come shuts down yeah and he that has actually happened to him and i know he wanted that like he drove the insurance and film crew and all that stuff crazy because he was actually like letting that really happen uh for uh dramatic effect so i think be, beyond what brian said and really just sort of talking the talk and like having agency for yourself and defending uh the work that people do i think 
we have not had control or agency over our own, our own narratives for millennia. Yeah, so uh, like, and we are just now, I feel like starting to make this, this change in this turn. That's why, you know, things like, why particular fellowships needed to be made for disabled writers, uh, you know, uh, or particular plays need to be made for disabled writers, which can also provide opportunity for a whole host of, you know, disabled audiences to come, disabled designers, you know, again, the, the, the art itself enables the, 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 the unification, the bring together, the gathering, right, of all, all these disparate communities. Um, but if for, uh, at least in, in my lifetime, if the only pervasive narratives have been uh, overcoming adversity, um, uh, you know, being a font of inspiration and dying with dignity, then, you know, uh, which I have had no say in, right, or opportunity to participate in, then we need to change those narratives. And the only way to do that is by creating new work and presenting that work uh, in front of audiences um, so people can uh, learn how to metabolize and ingest something new. And I just know in my experience to date, when I have tried to present a new narrative, uh, the audiences, I would say, don't know, quite know how to metabolize that. Um, but that's just where we are right now. And we have to, I think you just got to do it and do it and do it and do it and do it. Um, cause AA, you said this, we have so many stories to tell. We have so many histories, right. Within our, within our, uh, communities, right. And, and networks. Yeah. Um, that we're, we will not be without, uh, material, right. For, I think a, a long, 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 long time. Jonathan, did you have something? Um, yes, I would like to add to that, um, in terms of like, having so many stories to tell, having so many narratives. I would also like to say that I believe that we have um, uh, so many more um, allies than we, than we realize. Uh, and particularly what, I, particularly what I mean by that is so often when we have these conversations, we focus on producers, we focus on artistic directors and the artistic staff and, and that whole world, the world that we that we deem as gatekeepers, right? Um, and it has been uh, really useful. Whenever I get stressed out about wherever my career is going or what I'm working on or what's happening or what's not happening, um, what's always useful for me is to know that um, gatekeepers do not work or function in a vacuum, right? And so there's so many uh, different people within organizations, with support organizations, uh, who can certainly be advocates and allies for our work. Um, there's uh, donors, there's volunteers, there's uh, board members, enough people that you can get to raise a stink about whatever it is that we need to raise a stink about. And instead of just focusing our energies uh, entirely on uh, trying to um, uh, knock on or kick in the door of an artistic director or producer. And an example of that that I have is uh, this morning, um, I had a meeting uh, uh, with a, a board member at DTC about a project that I'm working on. And we were trying to plan um, another project to support it. and Going into the meeting, I had this really crazy idea that I, I wanted to propose, but I was like, you know what, that would never fly um, and, and they would never go for that or whatever. And during the meeting, the board member pops off with this crazy idea that I had that I thought they would never go for. And it's like, I think, like, I think we, what if we do this and this and this and this and all this wonderful stuff, right? that I had um, assumed was, you know, out of the question. And I think what I realized in that moment was um, going back to that thing about people operating out of fear is that sometimes we don't realize in terms of like artistic directors and theater people, um, the, uh, the fact that they might be operating from a certain space of fear out of fear is the right word, but that there's other people within an institution who do not 
have the same that same level of fear because they're not in the theater in the same way that that the artistic director is in. You know what I mean? Um, so, long story short, um, I believe we have allies, uh, and it's really like I don't know if this is a uh, a bad a bad choice of words, but it's the only choice of words I can come up with. It's just like realizing that there's so many boots on the ground um, that we often take for granted. Um, and we just have to stop taking that for granted. So. Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, go back to, so I, I saw that Tucker uh, have, has another note on, on their question about, uh, in response to what we were saying, uh, we did, and after 41 years, we still have the same issue. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, and I guess I, I want to say two things. One is, is keep fighting, uh, because you're not only fighting for yourself, and it may feel like you're losing, but, you know, in, in, in any small way you can, setting, setting a better stage for the next however many generations that come after you is, is important. Um, so thank you for doing that, and thank you for not giving up. Uh, and I, you know, this comes down to, well, in part, I think this includes a question that we discussed in sort of our pre-planning meeting is how do we, you know, who is our audience? And do we try to create art for ourselves and risk being, um, not attended by a, a larger general audience, or do we try to water what we are trying to say down in hopes that it will be accepted more widely? And like, how are we trying to create this art? And, you know, every time we all have seen examples of it, and we all know this ourselves, is that it's difficult to spend the time and energy and money to go experience something if we don't see ourselves on stage, if we don't see at least part of ourselves on stage. And there is, a, there is a risk if you are telling stories th that are about the disabled experience to have the general audience look at the description on your webpage and say, I don't see myself in this and I'm not going to spend that time and effort and money um, to go experience it. And it, it, it sucks, right? Uh, because you know, they could find themselves in that play if they just went to see it. But, you know, if you're fighting over people's dollars and people's time, uh, it's, it's, it's a brutal fight sometimes. So, uh, and that's a conversation, that's a much longer conversation that we had in our meeting. And, and I don't know if we have time for today, but sort of the question of, of do we create our own sort of playpen to create these stories in and, and how do we and if we want to invite other people in how do we do that how do we get our message out that it's not just a disabled story it's a story that you know everyone else shares uh i don't know where i'm going with that but i, I did want to respond to to that note from from yeah. no no i i think it's great uh i mean evan you mentioned the sort of top down and bottom up approach and maybe there's something to like those theaters again like i um, but, you know, I can, I can offhand name four or five uh, Asian American specific theaters in New York City alone, right? Um, in, uh, uh, you know, when I started my company, I, I was only, in my mind, I was only the, the, the second, you know, that um, really that was like rooted, you know, um, uh, on this issue, and there, there's like New York. Yeah, there are others, right? But again, there, there. We just we don't have. Again, we we almost don't have the numbers, right? We don't have the history. We don't have the we uh, at least present day history of like creating work. And I think those smaller theaters. Maybe scratch that. I, maybe I just didn't articulate that well. But those smaller theaters are the laboratories, are the experimental spaces, right? Uh, that will allow people to get the experience, opportunity, and exposure to train, get better, work with people, practice their craft, right? And hopefully you see people move up, yeah? Um, and hopefully those theaters are doing the work of engaging other, the larger community, right? Because we're not operating in a vacuum. We're part of a larger theater community in wherever you are, right? In New York City and in the United States. 
Yeah, and I think Jonathan, to your point, there are there are al- there are people. There are people everywhere. There must be people that are interested in saying, yes, I'm interested in this work. Let's have a conversation. I think you have to know, you have to sort of identify what is you're doing, what you do better than anybody else. Yeah. And who, who is interested in that and supporting that or aligning with, aligning with that. Um, and I think that's at the end of the day, regardless of what your specific mission might be or the specific population that you might cater to, for lack of a better term, that is that is just getting theater made, right? Anything artistic made, right? But particularly theater uh, or, or something in the, in the cultural sector or, or in this field. So while we may have specific issues to, to our work uh, and these particular communities, theater's theater's theater, right? And we wanna figure out how to keep making that uh, and producing the best work and getting it to the most people. And I think it has to happen. There's a lot of work to be done all at once and it has to happen in a lot of different sectors. Um, how do we how do we talk how do we talk together you know how do we build those connections so um i think that's four o'clock y'all that's our time if there's any um i just want to give a, any audience members any last uh kirsten i don't know if you have anything from your end and if anything came through uh question wise if you want to chime in if there's anything if not that's okay nothing on my end thank you all for a great conversation Thank you so much uh, again, Kirsten, for uh, facilitating and being our uh, tech guru here tonight, uh, this afternoon. I appreciate it. Um, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to uh, everyone who attended. And Kirsten, can you talk, will this be available elsewhere afterwards? Yes, so we have recorded this session and we will, on Art New York's end, we'll make it available on our YouTube channel and we'll send it out in a follow-up email. Queen Cedar, I'm sure we'll do their thing with it as well. Um, so it'll be available in multiple places, I'm sure. Uh, but thank you all, especially in these times when we can't be in the same physical space together. It's lovely to be in community and share space with you in the virtual realm. So thank you very much. I hope to see you all soon in, in whatever space that may be. Um, but please stay safe uh, and be well and um, happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Yeah, panels. If you wanna, if you wanna hang, uh, you don't have to leave just yet. If you just wanna hang, we can just say goodbye to each other. Thanks. Okay.